Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to Getting Up to Speed with Kafka Connect. My name is Kate Stanley. I'm a principal software engineer working at Red Hat, also a Java champion, a LinkedIn learning presenter, and as of October of last year, I'm also an author. So I have a book about Kafka Connect, so I'll share some links at the end if you're interested in checking that out. I've been at JFocus before, this is actually my fifth time, so I'm really excited. There's a reason why I keep coming back and I hope you'll enjoy my session. I've put this together with the aim of helping both those who are familiar with Connect and those who have never used it before. But to just help me out, I'm going to do some hands up. So who here is already aware of what Kafka Connect is? Cool. And who's actually using Kafka Connect? Anybody using it in production? Couple, cool, okay. So the aim of these slides is for those of you who are already using it, already familiar with it, I'll be giving some top tips for what you should be doing to make the most out of it. But if you've never heard of Kafka Connect before, then I'm hoping that I've put this together so that you won't get too lost. And by the end, you should have a really good idea of what it is and how you can make use of it. So before we go into Connect, I'm going to have one slide about Kafka. So Kafka, for those who don't know, is an open source distributed event streaming platform. It lets you publish and subscribe to streams of events, store streams of events in a durable and reliable way, and process streams of events as they occur or retrospectively. And Kafka Connect is part of the Kafka project. Connect has actually been around for a really long time within Kafka, and there's a very good reason for that. It's great when you first start off with Kafka to think, I'll have Kafka at the center of my architecture. I'll have all these lovely applications connecting. It's going to be great. It's going to scale really well. But in reality, this isn't normally what your architecture looks like. Normally, you'll have some existing external systems that you want to build into your architecture. And what you might find is that actually, if you've got lots of different applications that are connecting to your external systems and connecting to Kafka, that you can see there's quite a few that are connecting between the same external system and Kafka. Now, an easy way to solve this problem is to say, well, I'll just write a producer application, which is one that produces messages into Kafka, or I'll write a bunch of consumer applications that pull messages from Kafka. But every single time you decide you want to create a new pipeline that takes data from the external system into Kafka or from Kafka into your external system, you have to write a new application. And in reality, the chances are the differences between those applications aren't going to be that great. So what Kafka Connect lets you do is sit in between your external system and Kafka and you can deploy lots of different pipelines between the same systems with only configuration. So it lets you build complicated data pipelines using Kafka without having to write any code upfront. So I'm gonna start throwing some terminology in here now. So when you're deploying Kafka, what we're really talking about is deploying a Kafka Connect worker. So a worker is the container that we're running with Kafka Connect in. And then you're running one or more connectors. So connector is what's getting the data from your external system and putting it in Kafka or pulling it out of Kafka and into your external system. And we call this part of the flow a source pipeline. So that's using source connectors to get data into Kafka. And then the other half is a sync pipeline, pulling data out of Kafka. So in a nutshell, Kafka Connect lets you build these data pipelines in a way that is consistent because you're not writing lots of different apps, you're doing it in the same way with just some configuration changes. It's pluggable because you can have lots of different connectors that you run. And it's resilient because it, it's actually making use of Kafka to store its state. And there's some other features as well that help with the resiliency that I'll look at. Some good use cases for Kafka Connect are building data pipelines, as I've already talked about, but also interoperability. There are so many systems now that integrate well with Kafka. So often what you can find if there's two different systems that you want to connect together, 
if you can put Kafka in the middle and then use Connect, you can often get data between systems that was a little bit more tricky before. And you can also use it to extend existing systems. If you're familiar with Kafka, you'll know that it scales really well. So you can run lots of consumer applications against your Kafka cluster, and each time you add a new consumer, it doesn't add too much overhead. So it can be really great to add Kafka to an existing system, and then you can scale out lots of consumer applications to connect to this system that perhaps wasn't so accessible before. And then the final use case is mirroring. So the Kafka project has something called Mirror Maker. And Mirror Maker is built on top of Kafka Connect, and it lets you flow data between two different Kafka clusters. This could be to do upgrades, to have a backup. It's a really great tool to look into, but it is fundamentally built on top of Kafka Connect. So today I'm going to give you some best practices and top tips for running Kafka Connect. I've split them down into three different sections. So we'll look at getting started and deploying Kafka Connect for the first time. Then we'll look at building up your pipeline and the different options that you have available. And then finally, managing your Connect cluster. So in getting started, I'm first going to talk about some terminology because so far I've probably said the word connect and connector quite a few times in this session. Unfortunately, that's not going to reduce, but it's worth making sure that we're all on the same page with the terminology. So Kafka Connect provides a runtime for executing connector processes. Like Kafka, it's primarily written in Java. It's all open source, so you can go have a look at the source code here. But Kafka Connect isn't just a runtime that runs your connectors. It's also an API for implementing connectors. So if you want to write your own connectors and you don't want to just use the configuration option, then you can do that. And the API is a Java API. It's actually pretty straightforward to implement, but you can do some really powerful things with it. And in the book, we actually go into exactly how to write your own connector. So we've got Kafka Connect, which is a runtime and an API and then we have our actual connectors. So a connector is some code that has implemented the Connect API to write a connector, to get data from an external system or into an external system. But we also use the term connector to talk about the packaged jar file at the end of your build. And also to refer to the packaged jar file once I've installed it into my Connect runtime. And also to refer to the connector once I've actually started it. So this is the process that you've actually got running in your runtime. And I want to create a distinction between these two, and we'll see why later. But when we talk about the connector that's been installed into the runtime, we're going to call this the connector plugin. Whereas if it's just running, it's the connector. And to install the connector plugins, they're using the service loader. Uh, mechanism within Java, so you load them up into your runtime and they'll be ready to use. The other term that I want to introduce is task. So, so far I've talked about your Connect runtime and your connectors, but I haven't talked about tasks. So in reality, when you have a running connector process, it's really just doing coordination. Its main job is to spin up tasks, and the task is the actual thing that connects to the external system and flows the data. So if you want to implement the Connect API yourself and write your own connector, you need two classes. You need a connector class and a task class, and then you're done. So I've thrown a bunch of different terms there. Hopefully, when I now use the word connect and connector for the rest of the session, you'll understand what I'm referring to. So let's move swiftly on to number two. Run in distributed mode. So this is all about how you run Kafka Connect. When you deploy your workers, you have two options. So you can run a single Kafka Connect worker, which is in standalone mode, or you can run one or more connectors in distributed mode so that they're working together. It's worth noting at this point that these are separate from running Kafka. So if you've looked at running Kafka, these are gonna be running in a separate place. But you should always run in distributed mode. And the reason for this is because this provides you better options going forwards in terms of resiliency and scalability. So when you're running in distributed mode, what Connect will do is it will distribute the connector processes and the task processes across the available workers. 
This means if you scale up and you add more workers, then the workload can be evenly distributed. It also means if one of your workers goes down and doesn't come back, then the connect runtime will make sure to reschedule the running connectors and tasks on a different worker. The other good thing about this mode is I said you can run one or more. So actually, if you don't need more than one worker to begin with, you can start in distributed mode and have a single worker, but it gives you the option to scale up later. Whereas if you start in standalone mode, you'll have to remove that worker and switch to distributed. So in general, I would just recommend go with distributed. And there are four things that you need to check when you're running in distributed mode. So the first thing is the group ID. Every runtime in your workers has to have the same group ID. If they've got the same group ID, they'll par be part of the same connect cluster. The other thing is these three topic configurations. So a topic in Kafka, if you're not aware, is where all of the messages get stored. And I said that connect uses Kafka to store state. And it has specifically three topics that it stores its state in. An offset topic, a config topic, and a status topic. You also need to make sure that all of your workers in your cluster are using the same topic for each of these. But crucially, if you're running more than one Kafka Connect cluster against the same Kafka cluster, they need to be using different topics. So make sure for each individual Connect cluster you've got that these all match and that they're different to any other Connect clusters that you've got running. OK, so what's next? Mastering the REST API. So when you first start up the Connect runtime in your workers, you can just use this simple shell script to get started. But from there on out, you use the REST API to manage Kafka and any running connectors. So we can see here the basic getting started points. So to begin with, you will want to list your connector plugins. So this is where the distinction comes in. So remember I said that connector plugins are the ones that are installed Connect Runtime knows about them, but they're not running any processes. So that's those. If I want to actually start a connector to flow data, then I use the connectors endpoint and I can pass some configuration. Um, JSON is the easiest format to use here. And then I can also list the actual running connectors. I put a link here to the full REST API, so feel free to go and have a look at that. But I'll just cover a few other endpoints as well. So these are your basic getting started ones, but we also have some that allow us to manage the connectors going forwards. So the first is to be able to see the connector and task status. So you can provide some query parameters to give the full information of all your connectors and tasks. And this is really important because in connect, if a connector or task fails, it doesn't automatically restart. So you need to pay attention to what's going on with your connectors and tasks. You can also both pause and stop connectors. So the pause option has been around for a while, but stop is fairly new. And the difference between the two is if you pause, then your connector processes are still running. They're just not flowing data. If you stop, then everything stops. So that's then saving you uh, resources. But it does mean that it will maintain things like the name of your connector and things in the runtime. The other thing you can do is list, alter, and delete offsets. So again, this is quite a new endpoint within Connect. And an offset in Kafka allows you to specify where in the stream of data you've gotten up to. So they've now introduced endpoints that allow you to better handle where your connectors are going to be processing data from in the stream. I mentioned that you might need to restart tasks or connectors. And there are a few different endpoints that let you do this. So you can restart a specific connector using the top one or a specific task. But this bottom one is really the most useful because it allows you to restart both tasks and connectors, but only if they've failed. So that's definitely one to keep an eye on. And then the final endpoint I want to draw your attention to is the logging endpoint. So this is under admin loggers. And Actually, the admin endpoint, you can provide additional security just for those endpoints. So take a look at that. But what this lets you do is see the logging levels of the Connect runtime. And crucially, it lets you actually update the logging levels as well. So you don't need to restart any of your workers in order to change the logging levels. So you can see an example here where I'm adding a new um, appender and I'm saying, actually, for Connect, I want it all to be at debug level. 
So those are your kind of getting started ones. We've talked about the distributed mode, some terminology, and the REST API. But what about actually building your pipeline? And this really is where you have a lot of options with Connect. So first, let's talk about connector plugins. So a connector, it, so far I've talked about the connect worker and your external system and Kafka and then having your connector in between. But this isn't actually the whole story. In reality, we have the connector, which is responsible for talking to your external system. But the connect runtime is what's responsible for talking to Kafka. So this is the great thing about connect is it means that you don't have to worry about how to properly connect to Kafka and do that in a way that is best practice. The Connect runtime does this for you. But it does provide you some plugin points to help influence this behavior. So before we look at what those are, I'm just gonna have a side note about how data works in Kafka. So this is a Kafka record. So all of the data that flows into Kafka is in this format. So you have a key, a value, and a header. The only one that's required is the value. The key is for routing and is used if you care about ordering within the records that are going through. And then the header allows you to provide additional metadata. And Kafka itself doesn't actually care what's in the contents of each of these. It doesn't have an opinion about what the format should be within the key and the value. But what it does need to know when you're producing and consuming, Connect needs to know how to serialize and deserialize the data so that it can send it to Kafka. Because if the data has been serialized as JSON, then downstream applications will need to deserialize that as JSON in order to correctly read the messages. So you do this using a converter. So the converter sits between the connector and Kafka. And what this does is allows you to tell the connect runtime how it should process the data that it's sending to or from Kafka. And we have three options for those three parts of the record, the key converter, the value converter, and the header converter. And it's worth checking what these are. Don't just use the defaults because I've found so many people who've had problems and they've spent literally hours looking into their connector and trying to understand why the format isn't exactly as they intended. And it's because actually the converter sits in between and often connectors will do different things depending on what the converter has given to them. So definitely check what you've got configured and make specific choices about the converters you use. The next connector plugin that I want to talk about is transforms. So transforms sit in between the connector and the converter and these are actually optional. So you have to provide a connector and you have to provide a converter, but you can provide no transforms, one transform or many transforms. And a transform allows you to change the data in some way as it's flowing through your pipeline. There are some restrictions here. So the way transforms work in Connect, they only process one record at a time. So you can't do aggregations. If you're wanting to do very extreme processing and aggregation and things like that, then you should definitely look at a more dedicated system, something like Kafka Streams maybe. But this allows you to do some basic transformations as it goes through the system. You can do things like routing, so changing which topic the data is going to, sanitizing, removing fields, formatting, adding additional fields, and you configure them like this. So you provide an alias. So in this point, in this slide, the alias is drop topic. And then I provide a type for that alias. So in this case, I've picked one of the built-in transformations, which is called filter. And then the final connector plugin actually works in tandem with transformations and it's called predicates. So a predicate allows you to determine whether or not a transformation should be applied. A lot of transformations you can run without a predicate, but some always make sense to use a predicate. So the filter, if you don't provide a predicate, will basically remove every single record that it sees. So if you set that up in your pipeline and you don't get any data in Kafka, then that's why. So instead you need to configure your predicate. So you do that like this. So again, we have an alias. In this case, the alias for the predicate is topic match. I provide the type, which is the class name. So the topic name matches. 
and then I can provide a pattern. So in this case, I've said that I want all of the topics that are called my topic dot star. So it's a wildcard to match this predicate. And what this means is if I get my topic dot a, my topic dot b, the predicate will return true. And then I just link the transform to the predicate like this. As well as being able to implement your own connectors, you can also implement your own converters, transformations, and predicates. And again, we go into full detail in the book, but it is a simple Java API. They're actually fairly straightforward to implement. Um, these three, the connectors are slightly more complicated, but they all provide pretty much just one method that you have to implement. So you can definitely provide your own configuration if you want to, but there are loads of built-in predicates and transformations and converters and loads that are available in the open source community as well. So often you can run very different pipelines by just choosing those different connector plugins and configuring them. Okay, number five, know the worker plugins. So I've already talked about connector plugins, but connect doesn't just let you configure your data pipelines with plugins. It also lets you impact the way the runtime works. And the first one of this is configuration providers. And if you care about security, then you should definitely check out configuration providers. So here I've got some configuration for a connector. I'm using the MongoDB connector, which is provided by the Debezium project. And I've got to provide a user and a password for MongoDB. Obviously, I ideally don't want to provide this straight to my REST API. And the reason for that is because it will first get logged in Kafka Connect, but also anybody who has access to the REST API and can look up what connectors you have running will be able to see the password that you provided. So it's not very secure. So that's where configuration providers come in. They let you put in an alternative way to fetch that secret information. So there's one that's built in by default, which is called the file config provider. There's also a directory config provider and an MVAR config provider. The MVAR one is um, a bit newer, so if you haven't updated, check that one out. But it basically lets you say, actually, I want you to look in this file in the runtime for this data. And the way it works is you specify, again, an alias for your config provider. So the top one is runtime configuration and the bottom one is your connector configuration. So you say in my runtime, I have a configuration provider called file and it's using this class. And then in your connector configuration, you use the dollar sign braces and then the alias colon and then some information which is specified by the config provider. So for file, you specify the file name and then a key within that file. The different configuration providers do it slightly differently. Um, but check out whichever one you're using. And again, like connector plugins, you can implement your own configuration provider. The next worker plugin is REST extensions. So REST extensions allow you to customize the Connect REST API by injecting JAXA REST components. So you can inject filters to access and modify request and response headers. Um, and you can also use interceptors as well. So you provide them like this, REST extension classes is whichever one you provide. Um, and the, this basic auth security REST extension is again one that Kafka provide for you. So it lets you add authentication, authorization, validation. And then the final override for the worker plugins is connector client configuration override policies. I'm not sure why it has such a long name. <laughs> so this allows you to change the client configurations that the runtime is using. So I've talked about having your connector that connects to your external system, and then the fact that it's actually the runtime that's talking to Kafka. Well, the connect runtime is under the covers using some Kafka clients to produce, consume, and do admin requests to create topics and things like that. And you can actually override certain properties on those. But as an admin, if you want to restrict how individual data pipelines change those overrides, then you can do that using a configuration override policy. So the built-in ones all have aliases. So there's a full class behind each of these three. 
but you've got all, none, and principal. So all lets you override everything, none is none. And then principal lets you just override these three. So that's a great starting point if you're worrying about security and, and not wanting individual connectors to change the config that they're using for security. And again, as I said before, you can provide your own for this worker plugin. So this is an example of using it. So if you'd specified a connector client override policy to say you can override anything, then as a connector, you can do this. You could say like producer override batch size. So actually I want the runtime to have a new batch size that it wasn't the default. Okay, so we've talked about sort of building up your data pipeline and d using different plugins. Let's talk a bit further about building the pipeline and your options. So I would definitely consider using a schema registry with Kafka Connect. So if I have a data in an event that looks like this, so this would be my value in that record. I've got a title, a speaker and a room. This is fine, but ideally I should provide a schema to, that goes along with this data just to describe how it works. So this is an example of JSON schema. So you can see I've got the different properties. My title is a string, my speaker is a string, and then I've got an enum for the room. In Kafka, the recommended way to use a schema is not to actually send the schema each time with the record, but to instead send an ID for that schema and then store the actual schema in a schema registry. There are quite a few schema registries that work really well with Kafka, Confluent have one, and there's also Apicurio registry, which is an open source option. But if you're using a schema registry with Kafka Connect, because the runtime is what's talking to Kafka, it's not always obvious how you configure that. But you do it using a converter. So if you've decided to use a schema registry, which I would recommend, then make sure you check that your particular schema registry supports connect and specifically that it provides a converter. You should expect a converter to talk to the schema registry and if it's in a source pipeline, store the ID of the schema in the data. If it's a sync pipeline, it should be able to fetch the ID from your data and then go and talk to the schema registry. So here's an example of using the Apicurio Avro converter. converter. So you provide value.converter and then I can actually provide additional configuration to my converter just using a dotted notation. So here the specific config I need to provide is the registry URL. So if you're using security, you need quite a few more config lines here. Okay, so the next one is you should make use of dead letter queues. So a dead letter queue um, is used during a sync pipeline. So here we've got Kafka at one end and we've got our input topic. It's flowing through an Avro converter in this case, some number of transforms, and then my sync connector is putting it into the system. So a dead letter queue helps you if something goes wrong. So let's say I've got some producer applications that are sending data to my input topic and one of them sends data that's JSON and it's not Avro. When my Avro converter gets hold of this data and tries to deserialize it, it will obviously have an error. I said before that connectors and tasks don't automatically restart. So what this could mean is that your pipeline stops, you get a failed message, you can then go in and restart, but what Kafka will do, what the connect will do, is it will reread the message it's just got to. So it will then immediately fail again. So ideally, you need to provide a way to move past this record because records in Kafka are immutable. So what you can do is you can configure connect so that if there's an error in your converter, it will automatically send that record to a dead letter queue. So this is another topic within Kafka that can hold any of the records that weren't processable. And then you can run another application which can read off that topic and maybe report an error or do something different. But the great thing about dead letter queues in the connect runtime is actually they will catch any errors that come from the converter, any of the transforms and the sync connector. So if you compare this to writing your own application that's pulling from the external system and putting it into Kafka, you would have to put all of this handling in yourself. But with con the connect runtime, you just provide some configuration and off it goes to the dead letter queue. 
Okay, so I've now talked about terminology and getting started. I've talked about the building of the pipeline. Let's talk about managing your connect clusters. So I would definitely say use automation for managing your clusters. There's a few different responsibilities that you need to think about. So if you're building up your own connect cluster and assigning roles, these are the things you need to think about. First is restarting failed connectors and tasks. So I've already mentioned that you need to restart them. Make sure you have a process in place so you understand the flow, how to do that. Um, and you should also make sure that you're alerting whenever these go wrong. You should also look into scaling up and down because the more connectors and tasks you're running, then the more you're likely to want to have more than one worker. It's also a good idea to have multiple connect workers running so that if one of them goes down, you've then got another one that can have stuff scheduled on it. You should also think about how you're going to roll out upgrades. And this includes both upgrades to the connect runtime, but all of the plugins. So it's great that Connect is really pluggable, but it does mean you have more different pieces that you need to keep an eye on. And then also adding new connector plugins. So there's two steps to creating a new data pipeline. You first need to actually install your connector plugins into your runtime, and then you need to actually start them up. So it isn't just as straightforward as hitting that rest endpoint. You need to make sure they're available first. And there are a few different solutions and tools that I would encourage you to look at if you're wanting to manage a Connect cluster. The first of these is a Kubernetes operator. So if you're running on Kubernetes, then an operator basically allows you to handle sort of day two activities, things like upgrades, things like what happens if I want to scale up and down. And there are a few different ones available for Kafka. I'll talk about a specific one in a minute. You should also think about pre-built images. So if you're running in a containerized system, then every time you want to roll out a new connector plugin, you're going to have to rebuild a new connect runtime image with those jar files. So think about that flow and, and how you're going to get that. The Debezium project provides a bunch of different source connectors for change data capture, and they actually provide connect container images that have all of their plugins already installed for you. So that's definitely something you can look at. And then just other tools. Um, again, I'll provide a specific one, but Kafka is such a popular technology that there are loads of different UIs and CLIs and other tools that are springing up around it. So on Kafka Kubernetes operators. So Strimzy is the project that I contribute to, and it's a Kubernetes operator for Kafka, and it also manages Connect and by extension MirrorMaker as well. It's definitely worth checking out. It's a CNCF sandbox project, and it allows you to easily manage your Kafka and Kafka Connect clusters using Kubernetes resources. And I really like it for Connect because it allows you to manage your cluster in two different ways. So you can just use the Kubernetes resources for your Kafka Connect cluster and workers, and then use the REST API to start and stop everything. Or it also provides the option to have Kubernetes resources for your actual connectors as well. So you can manage the whole thing in Kubernetes if you want to, and you don't actually have to go anywhere near the REST API. So it's definitely worth checking out. They also have a built-in uh, mechanism to rebuild new connect images. So you can provide as part of your connect runtime to say, I want to pull in this connector plugin and this is the URL of it, and it will download it and build it. So it, that's really great for getting things up and running really quickly. So if you have more questions about Strimzy, then feel, feel free to come ask me because that's what I do day to day. <laughs> the other one I want to call out, I don't have anything to do with, but I just think it's really great. Um, this was created by Gunnar Morling. It's um, Casey Cuddle, which is your cuddly CLI for Apache Kafka Connect. And this basically replaces the need for the REST API. So it's calling the REST API under the covers, but it allows you to easily manage your connectors and your plugins and things using a CLI rather than having to call uh, the REST API. Okay, number nine, we're nearly at the end of the top tips. So this one is to rely on connect metrics. The Kafka project provides lots of metrics, which is great, but there are lots of metrics, which is frustrating when you're trying to work out which metrics are important. 
So I would suggest to start here. That I could do a whole talk about connect metrics. There's a whole chapter about connect metrics in the book. But take a look at the connectors and task status specifically. So as well as being able to quickly check on the REST API, there are metrics for these. So these are the ones you should be alerting on and making sure if this happens in the middle of the night, somebody gets up and restarts and checks what's going on. And then you've got the connection to the Kafka brokers. So it's fairly obvious to go, oh, I'll make sure that my external system is working, but it can be really useful to make sure you're looking at the connection between the runtime and Kafka, because there is a connection there. They're not running in the same place. So this can really help you to identify problems with throughput and latency and to debug issues. And the final one is connector metrics. So individual connector plugins can actually provide their own metrics. This does depend on the person who's implemented the connector, but take a look and see if the connector you're using provides metrics, because that can be really helpful. Okay, and then the final top tip is don't forget to upgrade. So Kafka Connect is moving really fast with always adding new things. So make sure you're on the latest version of the runtime to get the best features, but also make sure you're updating all of your plugins, because although the Kafka Connect API does provide a lot of backwards compatibility. Ideally, you want to be running the latest version of everything. So check those um, plugins as well. And this actually, I'm just going to promote Strimzy again. Strimzy has a really great feature where if you use the connector Kubernetes resources, you can then see the versions that you're running. So that's really useful. So I've talked about the fact that um, Connect is always adding new things. So those are my top 10 tips, but I also wanted to talk about what's new in Connect. So I'm gonna list three things here. Some of these are already in Connect um, and one is still on the way, but these are things that I think um, are really exciting and I hope you do too. Um, so let's have a look. So the first one is APIs to list all the connector plugins and retrieve their configuration definitions. So I think historically, although transformations and converters have obviously been there for a while, people really focus in on their connector when they're building their data pipeline. And if you just focus on your connector, you're really missing a trick because there's so much you can do with different converters and transformations. So previously in Kafka Connect, there were two endpoints that allowed you to see configuration and validate configuration. So the top one here is to see all of the connector plugins that are installed. But previously, this was just connectors. It didn't list converters, predicates, or transformations. And you can also then do um, a validate against um, a particular connector plugin to validate whether this specific configuration is valid. So every time I got a new connector, I had to basically construct what I thought the config was based on the documentation and then call the validate endpoint. And then it would tell me, oh, you forgot to provide the name of your connector. So we've now added two new <laughs> endpoints. So one of these is to add, it's not a new endpoint, it's a new query parameter, which lets you list all of your connector plugins, including transformations and predicates and converters. And then there's now a new config endpoint, which is great. So if you hit the config endpoint, then you get a list of all the configuration. So this makes my life much easier because when I get a new connector that I'm looking into, I can just list all the config. I don't have to construct anything first. So you can see the kind of thing you get back. So the name of the config. So this is file because it's for the file stream sync connector. Um, the type, whether this property is required, default value, description. The slight frustration about this is it again does depend on your connector plugin author so if you're using a connector plugin then do this and then go badger the author if they haven't filled this out because it's really useful to have this documented so that you're not having to guess what configuration is valid okay the second one i want to talk about is exactly want support for source connectors so this was introduced in kafka 3.3 if you're running a, so you remember this is a source pipeline. If you're running a sync pipeline, then exactly once depends on your external system. If your external system allows you to add a record to it and then understand what the error was and, and repeat, then 
you can probably sort out exactly once. But the source pipeline end is really the domain of the connect runtime. So this has now been added as of Kafka 3.3. So the way this works is it's looking at these two actions. So in our source pipeline, we're producing records into Kafka. And I mentioned earlier that Connect is storing offsets in a topic. So in the source flow, it's doing two things. It's first sending the record to Kafka and then sending an offset to the Kafka topic to say, this is where I got to. So that if the Connect runtime goes down and then comes back up, it knows whether or not to reproduce that message to Kafka. So the exactly once support has these three things you need to know. What it does is if you enable it, it means that source connectors use a transactional producer for writing records and offsets. So either the record arrives and the offset is committed or neither. If you want to make use of this feature, then you need to check your connector first. So individual connectors have to declare whether they support exactly once. And the reason for that is because this only works if the connector plugin is using the connect runtimes mechanism for storing offsets. If they're using their own mechanism, then we can't use the transactional producer, so the whole thing falls down. So you need to check whether your connector plugin has implemented this. Again, if they haven't, then go tell them to. <laughs> um, and then you also do have to enable it on your connect workers as well. So at the moment, it's disabled by default. So you first have to update your connect runtime and you can change the connect runtime to say, actually, I will only run connectors who have exactly once enabled or you can make it optional. But do check these two things. Is the connector using it and have you enabled it on your runtime? OK, and then the final one I want to talk about is connect transforms um, support for nested structures. So this has been accepted. So this means that the KIP, which is a Kafka improvement proposal, has been discussed in the community and they've accepted it's a good idea, but it doesn't actually exist yet in Kafka. We don't know which version it will be in, but hopefully it will be in soon. Uh, and what this lets you do is if we've got a record in Kafka that's got this as the value. So again, this is JSON. At the moment with transformations, you can't actually apply any transformation to these fields down here. So anything that's nested, so you can do changes to event and speaker, but not name, year, name, first name, Twitter, or um, email. You can tell I wrote that slide a while back. Um, but when this kit is implemented, you will be able to. So I've got an example here. So the top one is the configuration that I have in my connector. So I've provided a transform, which is drop email. And I'm using the replace field transformation that's built in. And specifically, I want to replace a field in the value of my connect record, my Kafka record, sorry. And so I can now provide a field style and say nested, and then I just use a dotted notation. So here it's speaker.email. So if I were to apply this transformation, then all of the records that arrived would then look like this. So I wouldn't have the email anymore. So keep an eye out on this. As I said, it's KIP 821. So hopefully this will get implemented soon. If you go have a look at the list of KIPs um, in the Apache Kafka community, then it'll have a link to where the pull request is and things like that. So that's all of my top tips. I said I would promote the book. Um, I'm really proud of this book. It took us a while to write it. Um, Mikhail Mason, who's my co-author, is um, a committer to Kafka. He's actually um, head of the PMC. And we had a great time writing it. We think it's really useful. I've got a link here. So the top link takes you to it on O'Reilly if you've already got O'Reilly. The second link here gets you a 30-day free trial to O'Reilly to read the book. And if you want the book for free um, and you're happy to give Red Hat your details, then you can go to the bottom link um, and you can actually get the full ebook right now. Um, so, yeah, please do check it out. I, I think it's a really useful resource. Um, and th that's all I have. So here's the link to more documentation for Connect if you're interested. If you want to know more about Kafka, then my co-author, Mikhail, he actually writes a Kafka Digest every month. So I've linked to where you can find those. Um, and then you can check out what Red Hat's doing around Kafka. And if you want to check out any of my previous talks, so I did one about writing your own connector plugins a while back, then you can check out my GitHub as well. Thank you very much.
I'll hang around here or if you want to come find me, I'll go to the Red Hat booth in the break as well. But if anyone has any questions now, then feel free. Yeah. Yeah, you can do. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can yeah. hear you. Yeah, actually, I worked on um, uh, MySQL source connector and sync connector a while yes. of year back. Um, so basically, uh, we have RDS instance for MySQL. You have what, sorry? We have RDS MySQL instance. Uh, yeah. And uh, so we used uh, Confluent Cloud uh, yes. for this uh, requirement. So where uh, we need to send the offer data to the source data in the Kafka topic and uh, my sync connector uh, read it and send it to the other external API. Uh -huh. That's the use case. So here um, we had to uh, expose the MySQL password in the Confluent cloud. Um, yeah. So we talked to the those people. They said uh, we cannot, um, you know, we cannot make it private. Understand because I mean? Connect is running on the Confluent Cloud. Exactly. Right. Okay. Then uh, we took it as a challenge and we, you know, dropped it off. Actually. Yeah. So I think you told uh, configuration providers that solved yeah. this issue. Yeah. So, yeah, Karen, what's your question? Or is it, or is it just to expand on? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the way a configuration provider works is depending on the configuration provider, you can tell the runtime to look in different places. So the examples I've given, so you have file or directory or MVAR, those are all really suited to if you're say running in Kubernetes, because what you can do is you can then have a secret, for example, that has your credentials in it that you've properly secured because you have to make sure that Kubernetes is configured properly for that. And then for example, mount that into the connect runtime and then make it available. That does, assume though that you're running the connect runtime yourself. So I don't know that I have necessarily a good answer for you in terms of how you do it if your cloud provider is running your connect runtime. Ideally, they would either themselves or allow you to provide a configuration provider that could then talk to an external system or authenticate or something. But because you're letting your cloud provider run connect, you're trusting them with all the credentials you've given to them. Yeah. So, I mean, if you want a really easy way to run Connect yourself, then check out the Streamsy operator. Um, and we have a, a like paid for version of it, AMQ Streams, that provides support. Um, but yeah, I don't know of what configuration provider you would be able to use because at some point the Connect runtime, which is running there, does need that information because it's the one that's talking to the external system. So it might be that for that scenario, having your own application that's running somewhere different and can talk and you can control the credentials might be the right answer. Um, what you could look at doing is if you've got a lot of systems that are connecting to Kafka or things like that, you could look at, for example, running a like small local Kafka cluster and then running something like Mirror Maker in between and then going from there if you really didn't want to write your own applications. Um, but yeah, that's the downside of because the connect runtime, it takes things away from you and so you have less responsibility, but you are then trusting the runtime with your credentials. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, Danica, who works at Confluent, is speaking next. So she might, uh, not here, like uh, <laughs> she's in the main room. Um, if anyone wants to hear more about Kafka, go check out her talk. But yeah, so um, you could also talk to her or equally like Confluent directly, but yeah, I don't work for Confluent, so. <laughs> Uh, one last one last question. Yeah. <laughs> so how this connector scaling happens, uh, you told, uh, because I we see some um, slowdown uh, because we are producing a lot of data. Uh, yes. And this connector is slowing down when... Uh, yes. So um, I actually have a session that I'm giving at Kafka Summit this year, which is in like a month, where I'm going to talk really in depth about how rebalancing works in Connect. So. I definitely don't have the time to go into it. It's a whole talk, um, but definitely check out the book. We talk about it in the book and I talk about the implications of running it on Kubernetes as well. But broadly, the Connect runtime is responsible for rebalancing the workload. Um, if you're seeing slowdown, then definitely make sure you're running on the latest version of Connect because in, I mean, 
it's been in for a while, but in the last like five years, they've been improving the way rebalancing works. So back in the day, it used to be that if you ran a connect cluster with connectors, every time you added a new connector, everything stopped and then restarted again. And that is absolutely not the case anymore. So make sure you're running on the latest version. But if you want like in depth, check out the book, but also my sessions should be recorded at Kafka Summit or like, I think you can watch them online and things afterwards. So um, I go into it in full detail in that one. <laughs> Thank you so much. Cheers.